But but I'll, 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 they, they watch him in the bedroom. Abigail has a recliner. She sits in in our bedroom, and we'll, we'll sit in there, and they'll watch those movies. And I'll come in in the middle of one of them, and I'll lay down and attempt to go to sleep. And I find myself getting interested in one of the good things. And, but they, I mean, my DVR is plumb full, and it's it's nothing that I like to watch. It's all Christmas Hallmark Movies, sappy, and every one of them is the same. Have y'all ever noticed that? Chick -fil -A. They're all the same. But yet they got to watch them. I don't know. But anyway, it, it's kind of like coming home for Christmas. You know, everybody would gather together in, in Jerusalem for Passover. And in Deuteronomy chapter 16, it says this. It says, three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord, before the Lord your God, at the place he will choose. At the festival of unleavened bread and the festival of weeks and the festival of tabernacles, no one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Now that'll preach. Uh, each of you must each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way uh, to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. But so we see that three times a year, every man was required to go. Is he wanting that bottle or this microphone? He, Earlier, Angel had him up here, and he was patting on the pulpit. He grabbed that microphone, and boy, he was chewing on it. One of these days, he might have one in his hand and doing something besides chewing on it. Amen? Amen. I'll be chewing on you all. Hallelujah. <laughs> but but uh, they was on this trip, and, it, and, and when they when they would go on these trips, when they would all of them caravan it, as we see here in the text, it kind of paints that picture. They would caravan to Jerusalem. They would all travel in, in, in a great number. And there was some reasoning for this because they would, they would do this to kind of protect themselves because there were robbers and thieves along the roads and, and they would hide in rocks and wherever else they could hide and jump out and rob you. And, you know, especially on their way to Jerusalem because you know they're going bearing gifts because they got to give and they, they've got certain things they need to, to give when they get there so they know they they have some belongings they can steal from them. So they would travel in great numbers uh, to get there. But on the way back, they realized that Jesus had went missing. They realized that he wasn't there. You know what makes me think of another Christmas movie that I absolutely cannot stand is Home Alone. Anybody like Home Alone? I no, actually, it was good when it first came out. How many years ago? A lot. And, and it seems like we have to watch it two or three times every year, and it just, I, I, I can't stand it. And, That's right. Uh, Don't uh, tell him, John. I don't like it. That's rude. I don't like it. Hey, I watched the cartoons, though, with Rudolph and Frosty, the old ones, the, the claymation ones. I like those. But uh, I, I'm, I'm so sick of Home Alone. They told me they taped it. Didn't you tell me you taped it last night? But it was you had to pay for it because it was on a one of them. Cinema. Yeah, cinema things. And I said, yes, we don't have to watch it. Oh, we're gonna watch it. Oh, I'm sure we'll watch it. But but it's kind of like that, you know. Macaulay Cock and his family they up and leave and they go on a Christmas vacation and then when they it's too late they realize they leave him at home. Everybody knows the story. And, and they leave him at home and they realize, you know, it, it, it makes you wonder, how could something like that happen? How, how can That's something big. like that happen? How can you lose your kid? How can Mary and Joseph lose Jesus? How can you lose your kid? I remember back some years ago, I was, I was coaching football a lot of years ago. And uh, the boys were little. I think I was coaching Timmy Ray and Isaiah's running around and, and you know, in help with the coach, I'm, I'm into the game. I'm paying attention to what's going on in the game. I'm not worried about the sidelines. I'm not worried about the crowd. I'm worried about the game. Now, this is a little league. This is maybe even a flag. I don't remember what we was playing at the time. And uh, But you know how dads and coaches are. They get really into it. They want their kids to be NFL stars and all this. And, you know, they, they don't weigh 30 pounds. And so anyway, I'm, I'm into the game and angels in the horn at the refs and and, and fussing because somebody threw a flag and they weren't supposed to throw a flag or whatever, you know how moms are. And uh, she was one of them crazy football moms. And so we're focused on this game. And then all of a sudden we realize, where's Isaiah? <laughs> now he's little. He's a little big fella. And uh, y'all know how he is. He, he's a little rambunctious and, and uh, crazy about things. And, and he, uh, he disappeared. We didn't have a clue where he was. And so I suddenly went from coaching and worrying about the game to 
where's my son? And so I'm looking around, and it's at the Little League Park up there in Shepherdsville, and you got two football fields going and two games going, and you got people everywhere. This is before COVID, so nobody's scared to show up. And so we're, we're all there, and, and you got all these groups of people, and, and I'm thinking, surely somebody has seen my son. And, and so I begin frantically walking around trying to find him, and I see him way out in the distance walking with some guy. And, and to me, it looked like they was headed out the gate. Well, I'm thinking, I'm fixing to put a hurt on somebody. So I take off to go to him, and he finally sees me come running to me. He tells me that the guy's trying to help me find him, mom and dad. But it seemed like to me they was headed in the wrong direction. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, it, it, it's a terrible feeling to uh, be in that situation. But it can happen. Amen? You can lose your kid. It's easily done. It's easily done. Just, just, you just get distracted by something and don't pay attention, and he's gone. And you might say, well, how did Mary and Joseph lose Jesus? How did they lose Jesus? As I said, they was in a caravan, a lot of people. And, and from the things I've read, generally, when they would travel like that, the women would travel in the front, and the men would travel in the back. So it would be easy because, you know, at 12 years old, what do you think Jesus is doing? He, he's a normal 12-year-old boy. You know, he, he you see all these uh, uh, ancient uh, uh, pictures that have been painted of Jesus, and he's walking around with a halo and, and all this stuff. You know, I'm going to tell you what. I bet you Jesus was getting dirty. He was playing. He, he was probably picking on somebody a little bit. And he, he was having fun. But without sin. Without sin. But he was having fun. <laughs> Amen. You know, we can have fun without sin. Amen. Right. And Jesus was, he was, I guarantee you, he was a fun, little, rambunctious little boy. Like and that. he was probably running around playing whatever. And they're used to that. They're used to that. Used to uh, him doing things like that. So it'd be easy if Joseph is in the back of this long caravan of people and, and Mary's probably in the front of this long caravan of people that Mary would think that Joseph was keeping an eye on Jesus and Joseph would think that Mary is keeping an eye on Jesus and really they didn't realize that they just left him at home. <laughs> like Macaulay Calkin. And they left, him, they left him in Jerusalem. And so there was a day's journey and then finally they realize, hey, he's not here anymore. Well, where did he go? Mary's looking at Joseph. Joseph, what did you do with our son? Joseph said, I don't know. He's your, what, what did you do with him? You know, it's your job, your mom. You know, I'm hanging out with the guys. Whatever. You know, they, they, they don't know where he's at. So they've been a day in this journey. So they travel another day back. And they're in Jerusalem. And they're walking around there for three days looking to try to figure out where in the world they left Jesus. And I want you to think about this. I want you to put yourself, if you can, if, if you've raised kids or, or one day, I uh, hope you all never lose little Jonah, but, but think about if something like that was to happen and you, he runs off for a little bit. And think about what's going through our mind. Think about what Mary and Joseph are thinking at this moment when, when they f son suddenly realize he's gone. Anybody could have him. He could be anywhere. And then they go to Jerusalem and they spend three days walking around and they still can't find him. And they're like, oh my gosh, what have we done? You know, because the thing of it is, they didn't just lose their son. They lost God's son. They was left, they, they was left with the responsibility of raising the one and only son of God. And they misplaced him. Can you imagine how they felt? I know how it feels to lose a child, but, but I can't imagine how it would feel to be in their place, to be in that position. When they find him, look with me here. They go to Jerusalem, they walk around for three days, they look for him, and when they finally find him, This is after three days they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding, at his answers. They were amazed at his understanding. They were amazed at his answers. And I want you to think about something. Later, in a handful of years, probably some of those same people that are sitting there listening to Jesus and they're just absolutely mesmerized at the things that he's saying. You know, it's not that they're so much amazed at his age. It's that the depth of his understanding spiritually. And they're sitting there and they're, they're listening to him. And they're, they're just in utter amazement. And I wonder, a handful of years later, 
Some of the same people probably sitting there are the ones that want to kill him. And they plot to kill him. And then there at the very end, as he's being arrested and, and being tried, and I wonder if they if their minds went back to that moment that they were sitting there listening to this 12-year-old boy talk about the things of God. I wonder if they thought about that when they yelled crucify him. I wonder if they thought about those things. Jesus was absorbed in conversation with the religious leaders of the day. I wonder if you've ever been absorbed into conversation. I've had plenty of times in my life when I've been in conversation with somebody about something that I'm passionate about, about the things of God, or maybe about hunting or something like that, and, and I just get lost. I, I, I forget that I've even been talking that long. And, and I, I remember uh, when I when we was younger, Angel and I, we was in school and, and dating each other, that there would be a lot of times that we would fall asleep and uh, we'd wake up and the phone was laying in the bed. You know, I, I, My phone would be laying there buzzing because I left it off the hook all night. You know, thankfully nobody needed to call home because we didn't, you know, there wasn't the technology that there is today. But uh, but we would just get lost. Really, it's mostly Angel talking because I just fall asleep. And she would just keep talking. And the phone would fall and there we'd be. But, but so, you know, y'all been in that situation where you get lost in conversation. Can you imagine talking for three days? Three days. What'd you say? Yeah. I wonder if you ever met a real inquisitive person or a really inquisitive kid that, that asked a lot of questions. You know, since Jesus was asking questions, he was asking questions. I, I, I'd like to hear the questions he was asking. I wonder if he was asking questions to make them to make them think. You know, because you know he, he really already knows and. And I wonder, I'd like to hear the questions that he was asking. That'd be kind of interesting to me. But I wonder, has anybody ever met an inquisitive kid that, that just gets on your nerves and, and just drives you absolutely bonkers because they ask questions about everything? As my boys was growing up, Timmy Ray, his slogan was, I don't ask questions. And he didn't. He would not ask a question. He, he would not ask how to do something. He would not ask a football coach anything. He wouldn't ask a teacher anything. And I'd say, son, you, you've got to you got to ask your coach about this. Dad, I don't ask questions. I don't ask. I said, well, how do you learn anything? I just pay attention. I said, you got it. I'm an inquisitive person. So I don't understand that. And, and he's like, Dad, I just, I just don't ask questions. Now, I say, on the other hand, Stopped. He never stopped. He it's a lot different now. You know, when you get to a certain age, you know everything, so you don't have to ask so many questions. But he learned uh, it all young. He said. Yeah. Uh, but but you know, he's the type of person always was as a, as a little bitty fella that if we was going to do something or going somewhere, he had to have it planned out. He had to know every detail. Every time we was doing this, every time we was doing that, how this is going to work, how that's going to work, what happens if this happens? <laughs> and he just wear you out. Now, we have a conversation about a vehicle or something, and I ask questions. Oh, Dad, you're just so negative. You, you just always find something. you got to find something wrong with it. I'm not even going to tell you about it because you're always going to find something wrong with it. I said, well, if it's a piece of junk, it's a piece of junk, you know. Dodge. <laughs> Easy now. Listen, they're probably quiet. You can hear a Chevrolet rusting out there. <laughs> but now it's a little bit different. Timmy Ray is the one that asks the questions. He'll call and say, Dad, how do you do this? Mom, how do you do that? It's a little different when you get married, get out on your own, and you begin to begin to ask questions. Amen? But Jesus was asking questions, and he was answering the questions. Notice, notice what it says here. It says uh, uh, in verse uh, 46, it says, After three days they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And notice in verse 47, And everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. They were absolutely amazed at his depth of spiritual knowledge. They were amazed at that. 
And then when, when Mary and Joseph, when they found him and they see what was going on, and, and, and they went to him, and, and it, in verse 48 it says, And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why, are you, why, why, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. She says, Son, why have you treated us this way? We've been anxiously searching for you. They were tore up. They were all been out of shape over this. You can't blame them. They should be. Amen? In the Greek, the word used there for anxiously searching, or in some places it'll say grievous over this, or, or there are different translations say different things, but the Greek word used there means to grieve. It means sorrow or torment. They were tormented by this. Remember what I said. They didn't just lose their son. They lost the son of God. They lost the son of God. And, and, and he's missing for, for four days actually. For four days. They had a day of travel. A day back. Three days in Jerusalem. So maybe five days. They were tore up. They were shook up. But Jesus was calm. Cool and collected about it. Calm, cool, and collected about it. it. Notice what it says here in verse 49. He says, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? It's like, what's the big deal, Mom? Anybody ever said that when you was a kid? What's the big deal, Mom? You know, you should have known where I was at is what he's saying. You should have known that's where I would be. Why would you spend three days in Jerusalem looking for me? Why wouldn't you look here first? That's basically what Jesus is saying to Mary. You know, the most anxious feeling that I've ever felt is misplacing a kid. Is not having a clue where one of my kids is. Mm. All right. You know, the situation with Isaiah that you feel that pit in your stomach, you feel like your heart's being ripped out, you, you feel like that, you know, your, your kid's going to be on a milk carton, is what you're, what's going on in your mind. And you're, 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 you're never going to know what's going to happen to them. All those things are going through your mind. Several years later, we were on a vacation, and we was in Oklahoma City. And uh, we was in this, uh, one of these uh, uh, motels, hotels, I don't know what you call them. It was Best Western. But it's one where you, you access the rooms from a balcony instead of in a hallway. And so we're in this room, and, and the way the room was designed, you walk in the door, and then there's, I think there was a, like a, a fold-out couch and some chairs and stuff like this, then a wall. And then behind that wall was the bed for Angel and I. And so the kids laid on that fold out bed. And I think I had to go maybe lay in like a recliner chair. And me and Angel slept in the bed on the other side of this wall. There wasn't a door or nothing. He just walked around the wall. So it was a little bit different. I hadn't been in one like that before. And so later that night, I'm having a dream. And in my dream, somebody has kidnapped Abby. And I can't find her. And I'm having a fit in my dream. Well, then all of a sudden, somebody knocks on the door. Some of you may have heard this story before. But somebody knocks on the door. Well, I immediately jump up awake, and I'm screaming, Abigail. And so I take off running in the dark through that room. I flip on the lights. She's not in the room. I open the door, and there's a security guard standing there with Abigail. Now, she's little. How old was she, you think? I was in little, little. fourth grade, fifth grade. Fifth grade? I thought she was younger It might have been fourth Thanks, grade. Yeah. It was fourth or fifth grade. Either way, to me, she's a little bitty. Yeah, I was little in fifth grade. So she's standing there in her pajamas with, a, with a security guard. And my teddy bear. And I'm like, what's going on here? Well, then she begins to explain what she thought had happened. And she said that, she said, well, Dad, I woke up in the room next door. And I come over here and knocked on the door and you didn't answer. So I went downstairs to find somebody. And this guy found her walking next to the swimming pool. Out in the wide open, not in a building. Right next to the interstate. Right next to the interstate in Oklahoma City. Everything in the world is going through my mind. But the one thing I couldn't get out of my mind is she says she woke up in the room next door. So I knock on the door. And this guy comes to the door and I said, hey, why did my daughter tell me she woke up in your room? Well, you can imagine what this guy said. What would you think if somebody knocked on the door and asked you that? And, of course, you know, I'm red-faced. I'm upset. I'm thinking of how many different ways I can 
do something to this guy. And and so he's he's standing out there and he's like, uh, he, you know, he shuts his door and, and he's standing there talking to me and, and the security guard's there and I don't remember if they called the police or well, I don't remember. But anyway, uh, I begin to interrogate this guy and, and uh, he, he is, he's scared out of his mind. He's thinking, I can't believe this guy's accusing me of these things and this and that. And so finally, later on, we figured out finally by talking to Abigail that probably what happened is she woke up, it's dark in the room, she opens the door, goes outside, shuts the door, because she thought she was in the wrong room, and she knocks on another door. Nobody answers, so she goes downstairs. And so I scared that guy to death for no reason, but I really was uh, trying to figure out why my daughter was in his room. And But anyway, it feels like your heart's being ripped out. And you're so shook up, you're so upset, you're so anxious, you're so fearful, you're so worried, you're so nervous, that you're just overwhelmed. It's like a panic attack on steroids. So I, I can sympathize with Mary and with Joseph and the way they felt at this time. They would have been absolutely beside themselves. Worried, sick, amen? Worried, sick. You know the worry and anxiety are very hard on our overall health. It's very hard on us. Very hard on us. Well, I could sit here and give you a whole list of things that it causes, but I'm not going to bore you with that. And you know, unfortunately, today, in the world we live in, it's full of worry. It's full of anxiety. And some of you, the cool hand loop types, are like Jesus What's the big deal? Some of you are warriors. Some of you get terrified. And I'm not just talking to those in here. I'm talking to those that maybe watch us on Facebook. That we allow things to build up and we allow ourselves to get so consumed with worry and anxiety and all of these type of things that it's, it's not only unhealthy, but it's unbiblical. Yes, it is. It's unbiblical. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen? Because see, the thing of it is, anxiety and worry is really fear. Jesus, in his early 30s, during his earthly ministry, taught about being worrisome. We're going to look here in a moment in Luke chapter 12. But you know, as I said, there's a lot of things today that people worry about. There's a lot of things today that, that have people all tore up inside. And, and I've had conversations throughout the week with people worried about things that are going on. And let's take the obvious, the elephant in the room. People worry about COVID. People worry about the political climate in our country. People worry about who's going to be in office. What's going to happen under a new administration? What's going to happen if it's the old administration, whatever, however this plays out, is the stock market going to crash? Am I going to lose my retirement? I wonder if I'm going to get COVID. I wonder if I'll even know if I have it. I wonder if somebody in my family is going to get it. What happens if I have to quarantine? Will I still get paid? Will I lose my job? Will I lose my house? Will I lose my car? Should I even leave my house? Should I wear a mask? Should I not wear a mask? Should I wear gloves? Should I not wear gloves? What should I do? What if they run out of hand sanitizer? What if they run out of toilet paper again? What if they, what if they, if the grocery won't stock the shelves and we, we don't have any food and I get quarantined and I can't leave the house and how am I going to have enough supplies? What are we going to do about supplies if the stores aren't stocked? People worry about so many things right now. And am I downplaying that? No, I don't mean to be downplaying that at all. It's legitimate things to worry about. You see, in the current world we live in, there's a million and one things that we can be concerned about, that we can be worried about, that will absolutely consume us if we're not careful. It will absolutely consume us if we're not careful. And there's a lot of people in the world today that worry about those things 24 7 until it drives them nuts. And it's not healthy. It's not good for us. Amen? Am I saying that we shouldn't worry? Not at all. Am I saying that we should just ignore uh, COVID 19 and act like it doesn't exist? Absolutely not. We should 
take precautions, but we don't have to live in fear. We should be smart about things. We should be wise about things. But we don't have to live in fear. To be full of fear is not of God. It doesn't line up with His will, and it doesn't line up with His Word. As I said before, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Look in uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 22. So then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, and what you will wear, for life is more than food, the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot... Do this very little thing. Why do you worry about the rest? Since you can't do this very little thing, since you can't add any time to your life, matter of fact, when we begin to worry and be full of anxiety and fear, we actually take time away from our life. We take time away from our life. Jesus said if you can't fix this one little thing and add time to your life, then why do you? Why do you worry about the rest of these things? Why are we concerned about these things? Yes, it's we should be concerned. And we should be prepared. And we should do things the right way. That is, that is biblical. But to be so consumed that, that it just drives you mad is not biblical. Look at the rest of what he said here in verse 27. Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God, God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what is on what you will eat or what you will drink or do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek His kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. You know, what Jesus is telling us here is that God is concerned with the created things of nature. How much more is He concerned with you who was created in his image Thank you, Lord. and his likeness. How much more concerned with you is he than the birds of the air, the grass and the field, the flowers that are so beautiful? How much more concerned is he with you? He said here in verse 30, he said, For the pagan world runs after such things. And your father knows that you need them. I'll tell you something, we can have great confidence in the fact that our father doesn't just know what we need, but he knows us. Amen? He knows us. We was having a conversation last night with Timmy Ray about, I forget what he, what he said. There was something he said. He said, well, dad always does that for me. We're talking about something to do with our hunting trips and things like that. He said, well, dad always takes care of that for me. And always talking about, a, a backpack and, and different things. And I told him how many backpacks I've had over the years. It's broke because, you know, I couldn't get one that was real good because I was always buying for three. And uh, I said, you know, I always packed enough stuff for three. As they was little, I'd have to pack three chairs. I'd have to pack all these different things in a, in a pack. And they wouldn't last me but a year because I'd break them. And, uh, and I said, you know, I said, we, I used to have to do that. And uh, we was talking about that. And I said, you know, I, I still do that to some extent. I said, when we get ready to go somewhere, I said, I'm packing extra because this is what I'm thinking. What's Timmy Ray going to forget? What's Isaiah going to forget? And I do that because I'm dad, and that's my job. Amen? You know, all you dads been there. You've done that. You know what it's like. And, and, and that's, 
because that's what we do. And if me, being evil, according to what the Word of God says, don't have to do good things for my kids, how much more can we trust that our Father is going to do good things for us? Amen. 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 He said, seek. Last verse, and then I'm done. Praise to you, come on up. He said, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. You know, when we begin to be kingdom focused, this is the main point that I wanted to get to. When we become kingdom focused, we're focused on the kingdom of God, then guess what? All this other stuff that's going on goes to the back burner. It's still there. It's still important. We still think about it, but it's not our primary concern. Amen. When our primary concern is focused on the kingdom, on growing the kingdom, on winning people for Jesus, on making sure people hear the gospel of Jesus Christ more important than anything else, then all of these other things just fall into place. And God begins to work it out. Why? Because when we're kingdom focused, we know that we can put our faith and our trust in Him. And He is going to make a way. And He is going to make a way. He's going to provide for us. And He's going to protect us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I encourage you this morning to begin to be kingdom minded. To begin to be focused on the things of God. Mary and Joseph was worried about Jesus. Searched for him for three days. And think about what Jesus said to him. Why were you searching? You should have known where I would be. You see, Jesus was kingdom focused. He was kingdom minded. Mary and Joseph was distracted by the cares of the world. They were distracted by their own fears and anxiety. And it kept them from thinking about where Jesus would be. Let's don't let the things of this world distract us. Let me pull this back up. There's a verse I want to share with you. He said, be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and anxieties, and the anxieties of life. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down by the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch. And pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus is telling us there, listen. Don't let our hearts be weighed down by the anxieties of life. But to be kingdom minded and focused on Him. And focused on the task at hand. Listening for that trumpet call. Because it's coming. Amen, because it's coming. Church, let's be kingdom minded. Let's be kingdom focused today. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we just come to you this morning. And Lord, I pray that you help us to be focused. That you help us, Lord God, to be kingdom minded. That you help us to be kingdom focused, Lord God, to fix our eyes on you, on the task at hand, on the things that you called us to do, Lord God. Help us to be wise. Help us to be wise.
us spiritually. But help us to stay focused. about those that that need to know you, Lord. Help us to live it out before people. Lord, I pray that you put such a desire in our hearts, Lord God, to read your word, to pray, to spend time in your presence, Lord God be prepared, to be ready, to be instant in season and out of season. We've got always ready to give account for what we believe. I pray that you help us, Lord God, not to be consumed with fear and anxiety and worry. Help us to trust you in every aspect of our life, Lord God. Help us to trust you in our finances. Help us to trust you with our health. Help us to trust you in everything, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to be sensitive to your leading, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's guiding us, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we just give you praise this morning. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Let's worship God for just a few moments before we close. Amen.